The story of a woman anointing Jesus while he is talking with unnamed companions occurs in all four of the Gospels. In the three synoptic Gospels on which we will focus, the woman is unnamed, as are most of the characters in this particular episode. This event was so important to the early Christian communities that it inspired the tradition of foot washing on Monday Thursday that continues into the present day for many traditions. In this presentation, we invite you to explore the layers of meanings behind this generous outpouring of love and devotion. There are certain aspects of this story that are common to all three of the Synoptic Gospels. The bones of the story are this. Jesus is sitting, perhaps reclining, at a table with unnamed companions, perhaps the disciples, perhaps others, after a meal. Only Jesus and one other character, Simon, are named. During the conversation, a woman enters the room, opens a jar of very expensive ointment or oil, and anoints Jesus. Those in the room are offended. Jesus responds. The synoptics differ in the details of how the woman anointed Jesus, the reasons why those present were offended, and Jesus' response and interpretation of the woman's act. In all of them, however, the woman is reported to have remained silent. So we have only the evangelist's record of Jesus' interpretation of her act. Her words and thoughts have been lost to silence. And while he was at Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly. And she broke the flask and poured it over his head. Mark chapter 14 verse 3. With this verse Mark sets the scene. We are not sure who Simon is other than he owns the home where they are gathered and he has been afflicted with leprosy at some point. Is he a leper whom Jesus has healed? Is he present at the meal? What is his social station? the text is silent. Likewise, we know nothing about the woman. Clearly she has the ability to amass some amount of wealth, as she has this very expensive oil. We are told later in this passage the value of the oil is 300 denarii, an amount equivalent to a year's wages for a laborer. Did she purchase the oil for this purpose? Was it oil that she had saved for some other intended purpose? Those who are at table with Jesus are offended, saying, This ointment might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. Mark chapter 14 verse 5 The woman does not defend herself. Jesus speaks for her, saying that she has anointed his body in preparation for burial. We are left with no indication of whether or not this was the woman's intent. Readers are led to interpret her actions as Jesus did. What is certain is that this action was important to Jesus, as he further tells those present Wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Matthew's account is quite similar to Mark's, differing only in a few details. Both the breaking of the flask and the specific detail of the oil being nard are omitted. The oil is said to have been able to have been sold for a large sum, not the 300 denarii specified in Mark. 
Also in Matthew, the dinner companions are identified as the disciples. The story in Luke is quite different than that presented in the other two synoptic gospels. Luke has separated this episode from the passion narrative and transformed it into a lesson in the power of love and forgiveness. The woman is described as a woman of the city who is a sinner. We do not know the nature of her sins or her social status. Some commentators have read into this story that she must be a prostitute, but the text is silent on this matter. Such an interpretation is far from certain. What we do know is that she is clearly moved to great emotion in her ministry towards Jesus. The Pharisee, whom Jesus addresses as Simon, finds her touch repulsive and thinks that if Jesus knew what sort of woman she was, he would not allow her to touch him. There is no direct berating of the woman as found in Matthew and Mark. Rather, Jesus demonstrates his prophetic powers to discern Simon's unvoiced thoughts. He uses the woman's actions as illustrative of extreme love and hospitality. In contrast to the poor hospitality shown him by the Pharisee, he addresses her directly, tells her her sins are forgiven and that her faith has saved her and sends her away in peace. We invite you now to pause this presentation and gather in small groups to read over the three passages from the different synoptic gospels and consider as you do so the following questions. What clues do you find in the gospel as to who the woman might be? What impact would it have on the story if we knew more about her? It might be interesting to have someone in your group read each episode aloud to the rest of you. We'll gather back in about 10 minutes when the conversation has wound down. Considered in light of the societal and behavioral expectations of a first century Jewish woman, there is no escaping the shocking and disruptive nature of what this woman did. Such an act would probably be rather shocking today, although for different reasons. This story is one of a handful presented in the Gospels, where a woman takes action and initiates an encounter with Jesus and the impact of these stories on first century audiences cannot be overlooked. They would have recognized the uniqueness of these actions and thus the importance of the message contained in the pericope. Matthew and Mark use this power to underscore Jesus' identity as the Anointed One, the Messiah, an identity that is eventually revealed only as his death and resurrection. Luke uses it to highlight Jesus' authority to forgive sins and teach about God's generosity in forgiving sins. The messages are quite different, but the power is undiminished throughout the Gospels. This woman takes control of the room to carry out her act of love and devotion for Jesus. It has been suggested that by leaving the woman unnamed, the evangelists have made room for marginalized people and populations to find a place of power for themselves in these stories. The responses of the witnesses vary widely between the Mark and Matthean accounts and the Lucan account. Mark and Matthew place this episode at the beginning of the Passion narrative, immediately before Jesus' betrayal and arrest. This placement means this episode takes place near to Passover, 
a time during which care for the poor was a particular concern for the Jewish people. The concern, then, is that what could have been used to benefit the poor has been wasted on Jesus. The witnesses rebuke the woman, telling her that she has done a pointless thing. Luke, in contrast, has separated this story from the Passion, placing it much earlier in the Gospel story, at a time when Jesus was still in conversation with the Pharisees. In this instance, it is not the value of the oil that is of concern, but rather the nature of the woman and her suitability to touch Jesus. Simon, who is presumably the Pharisee in whose house the meal is taking place, says nothing to the woman, only speaking to himself. In Matthew and Mark, Jesus responds directly to those who have chastised the woman, defending her, but he does not address the woman directly. He makes reference to his impending death and subsequent burial. As readers, we are left to place meaning on the anointing itself. We can accept the meaning given to us by the evangelist, that it was to prepare Jesus' body for burial, or we can look for parallels and deeper, more obscure meanings. In the Old Testament, prophets anointed kings. These stories would have been familiar to the Markan and Mithian communities for whom their Gospels were composed, and it would not have been difficult for them to draw the parallel that this woman was acting in a prophetic manner, anointing Jesus as King and Messiah. The account in Luke has a significantly different lesson to offer to the reader. This story focuses on love and forgiveness. Jesus traps Simon in his own hypocrisy by asking him, who will love the master more, the debtor who has been forgiven much, or the one who has been forgiven only a little? Simon predictably answers that the one who has been forgiven much will love the master more. Jesus then points out the deficiencies in Simon's hospitality in comparison to the woman's outpouring of love. Jesus in this passage speaks directly to the woman telling her, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Luke chapter 7 verse 50. This table summarizes what we have discussed and observed about this passage in the three synoptic gospels. The locations differ. Matthew and Mark place this event specifically in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper. Luke places this event at a Pharisee's house, possibly in Galilee. The officiant, if we consider this to be a right, is an unknown woman, although in Luke she is specified to be a woman of the city who was a sinner. In all three accounts, Jesus is the subject of the right, which takes the form of an anointing with ointment. Matthew specifies that the woman takes an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment and pours it on Jesus' head. Mark has included more specific action in that the woman breaks the flask and pours it over Jesus' head. In Luke, the woman brings an alabaster flask of ointment and weeps while she anoints Jesus' feet wipes them with her hair and kisses him. Mark leaves the guests unnamed, as does Luke, naming only Simon and Jesus. Matthew specifies that the disciples are present. In Matthew and Mark, the effect of this rite is the preparation of Jesus for burial. 
Jesus in turn honors the woman with a unique memorial in the gospel, saying that wherever the gospel is told, she will be remembered. In Luke, the anointing is seen as an act of hospitality by Jesus, an act of love. And in turn, the woman's sins are forgiven and those present question, who is Jesus that he has the authority to forgive sins? We invite you once again to break out into your small groups and consider and discuss what lessons for today do you see in the Markan and Matthean stories? What lesson do you see in the Lucan story? We'll come back and discuss as a large group in about 10 minutes. We leave you with a suggestion for further study and some questions for reflection. John's Gospel is quite different, but yet somewhat similar to these accounts. We invite you to read John chapter 12 verses 1 through 8 and consider this passage in comparison to the three we have presented here. As a way of putting this act into context, consider what action one might take of similar impact now. Can you think of something that one might pour out for a person that is worth a year's wages? A year's wages at $10 an hour is in the neighborhood of $2,000. What message might one be sending with such an act? To whom?